I'm Dan Solomon. I'm going to be the moderator for this discussion, which I think is the perfect follow-on to what Leo just uh, showed us, or the views he just expressed. Uh, this is the counterforce to uh, what, what Leo is trying to tame. Uh, first, let me say that the... Um, you can get 1.25 or 1.25 AIA credits or 1.25 AICP credits um, for continuing education. For AIA, please have attendees sign at the back of the room and remind them they can write their names to write their names and AIA numbers clearly. Okay. For AIC, AICP attendees, report attendance online, little difference, to organizations. They can search the event at number 19209 for a list of all sessions and tours from CNU 20. Announcements made. I'm Dan Solomon. Uh, I agreed um, to uh, moderate this session, uh, and I'm going to have a little transgression of my role as moderator. Twenty years ago, uh, CNU was formed as a counter movement to two dominant uh, forms of urban growth in the United States. Sprawl in its various manifestations and hegemonic modernism in its pure and its various corrupted forms. I think over the past couple of days uh, we've seen CNU claim some success, modest success at least, in helping to alter development practice in the United States. But in that same two decades, I'm going to send this flying. In the same two decades, uh, the rest of the world has been going, proceeding merrily without us. In the same 20 years, China has probably built more than the rest of the world combined has ever built in a century. And almost every last bit of that construction is according to the very models that CNU was created to resist. All over Asia, all over the Middle East, some of the largest enterprises in city building ever have confirmed the worst dystopian fears of new urbanists about what rampant growth might look like. The, the bright side of that picture is that much of it is so awful by every measure, cultural, social, ecological, that it leaves us all, us all, a lot to do in the next 20 years. Uh, in some places, in China in particular, the bitter lessons of mistakes are slowly becoming clear. Part of our job is to identify those mistakes, identify the policies that created them uh, and their consequences. Another part of our job is to find fissures in the orthodoxes, orthodoxies that have created such terrible consequences for cities around the world and insert ideas about real urbanity into the cracks. Today we're going to discuss examples of each kind of job. One is the documenting of failed policies and models, and the other is opportunistic insertions. Uh, I agreed to participate in this session if I could be a moderator, not a presenter. Uh, and at first I will introduce our presenters, the real ones, and then I'll make, begin this with a small transgression of my moderator role for a few minutes and make my own opportunistic insertion of an opportunistic insertion that, that we happen to be right in the middle of. And this may help set the frame for what Doug and Paul will do. Doug Kelbaugh is something of an unsung hero in the 20-year story of new urbanism. Behind the scenes, sort of, he adroitly used his role and his opportunities as chairman of, architecture, of the architecture department at the University of Washington, and then later for a dozen years or so as dean of the Taubman School of Architecture and Urban Planning at the University of Michigan. He used these roles to help, to, to help formulate, to criticize, to encourage, and to promote the ideas that became new urbanism and to provide a crucially important platform for many of us, uh, including Peter Calfort and including me. 
Uh, after stepping down as dean at Michigan, Doug launched himself into what appeared to be a position of extraordinary influence and power on emerging urbanism around the world. He took the job as director of design for limitless development of Dubai, then one of the most ambitious and visionary of the major players on the international scene. He returned from that experience, perhaps uh, a little shaky in the knees, but filled with impressions and insights that he's eager to share with us. Paul Whelan is a partner at Robert A.M. Stern Architects. He plays a key role in a famous practice, a, a, brave and collaborative, a brave collaborative practice that has flourished and survived while defying the orthodoxies that dominate the architectural mainstream. It's a practice that has embodied the continuity of architectural and urban culture and has sought to recover the lost threads of that continuity in places that they're deeply buried. Paul will show new work in China. First, I can't resist uh, sh uh, showing a brief glimpse, and it'll be very brief, of what my partners and I have been up to in China for the last uh, few months, couple of months. Our task is to design an affordable residential neighborhood within a vast uh, master plan. Uh, for the exploding industrial satellite city of Binhai, uh, adjacent to Chen Tianjin, about 60 miles from Beijing. Uh, the, this is, uh, I see if I can do with a pointer. Uh, our site is, uh, find it. Um, oh, our, our site is this. 1.1 by 1.3 square kilometers, 1.1 uh, by 1.3 kilometers uh, to house 30,000 people by Chinese standards, a small infill project. Um, for the past 20 years, uh, China's housing program has demolished and replaced literally hundreds of millions of, of squalid, overcrowding dwellings with areas of new housing that are more vast in scale than any such enterprise in history. This is also the context for what Paul will show. Virtually all of this fabric has been built to a model that totally eradicates what new urbanists would cherish most highly in, the, in historic Chinese cities. The new pattern on the top, the old pattern below. The corollary to this largely automobile uh, served pattern of superblocks is this pollution and congestion beyond any previous measure anywhere in the world. The loss of urban culture is perceived as a problem by a few Chinese, but the congestion and the pollution issues are so gross and so extreme that they're obvious to everyone. Uh, but they are doing something about it. Uh, on our little site, there are, uh, as a new public, uh, transportation infrastructure, which shows three light rail lines, a commuter rail line, uh, and a bus rapid transit, all under construction, all to be completed within the next two to five years. It's a, it's a, uh, a level of investment in public transportation that is unimaginable here. <clears throat> This, this is the, our, our, little, our little plan, our little infill plan for 30,000 people, and I'll sh show it just very, very rapidly. Uh, the task as we perceived it is first to understand and then to manipulate the inexorable forces that have created the gated superblock, the automobile supergrid, and parallel rows of buildings. We see that our job is working within this set of constraints and within the density uh, uh, obligations uh, th that or density pressures that are there to create the opposite, to create walkable, bicycle, transit-served, mixed-use neighborhoods of perimeter blocks with a hierarchy of streets and rich streets li street life on at least some of them with no need for automobiles, recognizing that Chinese with any degree of affluence will want to own automobiles. Uh, we have, whoops, go back. We have a great residential crescent, a center block, a BRT, 
a uh, light rail stop, a pedestrian and bicycle infrastructure of, of walkable streets. This pointer doesn't work. That cuts through. I don't want to blind you with this, Paul. I'm sorry. Maybe I'll do it to this side. Use the. Oh. Like that? No. I think you're better off with laser. I've got a lot of advice here. <laughs> How about this one? Okay. Walkable pedestrian and bicycle streets that lead to the transit stops and to the um, BRT, big park in the middle, three neighborhood centers, all within walking sheds. I'm not going to linger over this. Excuse me. That's fine. That's fine. Okay. The, the, the uh, uh, walking sheds from the, uh, uh, the various elements of transportation infrastructure, the walkable and bicycle path, uh, path and a very brief uh, glimpse of a drawing in progress, about half done, of what a new walkable, bikeable uh, residential fabric at Chinese densities might look like, what new urbanism at Chinese densities might look like. I'm going to end with that uh, and uh, give Doug his 25 minutes uh, to show some uh, bit of dystopia in Dubai, uh, and then Paul will follow immediately after. Okay, thank you, Dan. Uh, where's the... Uh, good morning. So let's start here. We, whoops. How do we go back here? We go back one? Button to the left. So in many ways, Dubai was a sort of trial balloon or pilot for what China is now doing. It started earlier, it peaked earlier and in many ways sort of ended earlier. We'll see what China does, but Dubai is very much proof positive of what we've been pursuing uh, as the correct course. Uh, they've taken a radically different one, which I think is a really vivid uh, exemplar of, of what not to do and um, sort of validation of the last 20 years of CNU. You probably know where Dubai is. It's in the United Arab Emirates. It's pretty much a desert on the Arabian Peninsula. Dubai itself is, you can see that little uh, exfoliation of the sand right there. That's Dubai. This is Abu Dhabi you've also heard of. It's quite beautiful in parts, inland, in the desert. Although, to be honest with you, much of it looks like this. It's flat, it's hot, it's humid, it's dusty. And there are lots of temporary workers' housing like that. Humid and hot. You can go inland a bit and it gets less humid. But uh, no, it's a pretty miserable place for six. Three months of the year are hot and, and another three months are just hellishly hot and humid. It is, the, uh, in fact, the greatest producer of dates. And to many people's surprise, it's also got manufacturing. This is the largest aluminum plant in the world. Contrary to most opinions of the Middle East, there is some um, industrial production. So here's uh, Dubai. It's about 20 miles of shoreline. Uh, it's, it started here around this little creek, and it wasn't long, like f about 30 years to build this cluster of buildings, for which it's quite famous, a, a sort of collection of perfume bottles or other trophy buildings, icons, whatever, lined up along this main street, which is headed south to Abu Dhabi. It's amazing that this is a, a, a villa neighborhood right next to these 70, 80 story uh, towers. That's the main street. It's of course absurdly wide. This is that same view about 25 years earlier. 25 years from that to that. So it's grown from a little purling fishing village, practically nothing in the 1800s. Uh, I can't read that, but you can see it was very small. What's that date there, say? Yeah, so it went from about 50,000 to about a million five or a million seven, nobody knows, in about 45 years or so. And it's, it, at its most hubristic moment, planned to go to about six or seven million. 
um, which of course it's not going to make. Here it is as a little purling village on the creek and uh, this is not exactly the same view but pretty much the same view from a higher vantage point about 40 years later. You don't build this kind of skyscraper to house people or to give tourists a view or even necessarily to make a profit. You do this to make sure the world knows who you are. This is the Burj Khalifa, uh, an amazingly tall, actually an amazingly beautiful building. It's one of the better works of architecture uh, for a lot of reasons I don't have time to explain. It's, it's not only the tallest building in the world, it, it, it's next to the, what was then the biggest mall in the world and there's a lot of other uh, interesting sort of traditional development. This is called Old Town as well as this sort of mega new town. It's actually, believe it or not, one of the few walkable places. This sort of arms race for ever taller, uh, more exotic icons uh, has accelerated. That's four years of growth right there around the world. Uh, and right now the reigning champ is Dubai and probably will remain that way for quite a while. In fact, it's designed to go even taller if necessary. Literally, it can grow. They don't want to be overtaken. But as Rem Koolhouse, our arch enemy, said, you know, he doesn't even want to do a building there. He points out a building by, by his firm or by Zaha Hadid's firm wouldn't even be noticed. It's just a sort of circus or riot of one building shouting louder than the next. This is, of course, not Dubai. It's a photo montage, but you get the point. There are some pretty dramatic buildings, though. This is a long ways from downtown, the famous hotel you've seen. Uh, this is the sort of low-rise villa development I'm going to talk about in a minute. There's some, uh, a, we had a really plush red carpet rolled out when we went because we weren't very interested in taking, moving to Dubai to say the least. The first helicopter ride, about three minutes into it, we flew over this building. This is the Sheikh's brother's new house. I mean, the scale of sort of obscene grandiosity is remarkable. Then there are things by his brother like this atrium in the shape of a, I didn't even know when I took this photo it was a horse's head. It was only when I saw it on my computer. I realized just the zaniness of it. And then you, you know about the famous ski slope. That big mall I just showed you from the air has really a very fine aquarium in it. I think it's the world's largest piece of plexiglass. Everything is the world's largest or the world's first or the world's best. This is looking down from, I don't know, the 160th floor on this uh, incredible dancing fountain done by the same designers as the Bellagio fountain in Vegas, but of course, bigger. And then there's this sort of consumption. People fly to Dubai from all over the Middle East to buy. It's a shopper's sort of paradise. That's a big part of their economy, and uh, it's pretty over the top. You know about uh, some of these famous palms that are basically land reclaimed from the Gulf. This is the opening ceremony for the Atlantis Hotel, which happens to be at the end, right after we moved there. This was done by the same folks who did the Beijing opening ceremonies for the Olympics, but much bigger and higher budget. This is a rendering looking back from that Atlantis Hotel down the stalk of the Palm to uh, a, a sort of suburban downtown uh, called New Dubai. And believe it or not, our apartment completely by chance was on that axis exactly. Here we are looking out of our living room window from the 31st floor. It looks like it's pretty close. It's actually about two miles to that giant hole in the Atlantis. And of course you don't see the, the horizon because it's a never crisp, uh, clear day in Dubai. It's always either dusty, it's not so much pollution, but dust that's blown in from the empty quarter. Um, in any case, this was a, a pretty extreme, after do Ann Arbor and Seattle, this is a pretty ex extreme change. But I have to say, our neighborhood was actually one of the more walkable, small-scale, gridded ones, and we could walk to a store and so on. And we had not one but two Chrysler buildings in the neighborhood, which, believe it or not, actually did provide some navigational assistance, because it's not often you see two. So we, we often use that as a homing device. So here it is growing uh, from just 2000 to 2009 or so. It was probably a little bigger than that because there are a lot of people unaccounted for, but they thought it was going to go up to, you know, say 5 million. Of course, it dropped 
we move back about then. They say it's going to go back up. I don't think it will, although the Arab Spring has benefited it because it's still the most stable place in the Middle East. Even more money is going there to buy these empty condos in these tall shells that are still being built. So here's the sort of full build out and it's full hubris. That's the palm. We live there. That's that palm. That's built. This one's built. This one's built, but they're not developed. This one's built. This is one that Peter worked on, Peter Calthorpe, and oh, it's a lot of interesting stories. No, he actually made a transoriented, but he lost that battle, and that was the, the birth of Limitless in a way. This, a lot of this hasn't been built, the so-called universe, a lot of that is built. This is the biggest man-made port, and that's the biggest man-made airport. That's pretty much open for cargo now. Here's the other airport. This project was one our firm did. Our firm mainly worked in, in China and Russia and Europe and Africa and the Middle East. We did do this one project right here and another one here I'll show you. So this is what had been built since 2006, a Manhattan and a half. That's what was under construction while we were there and that's what was more or less canceled. Well, those are Manhattan Islands. Uh, of development, not, not, not the FAR of Manhattan, but the, the area of Manhattan. So you can see just how over the top it was. And indeed, the, the biocapacity just plummeted. That's the ability to sort of absorb waste, provide food, and you name it. And the per capita eco footprint went from about two to over 10. It's actually slightly higher than the United States. It's the highest in the world. However, they're doing a lot of construction. If you took the construction out, I think the U.S. would actually be worse. So the environmental paradox of cities, which is what this is all about, says that when humans cluster in dense mixed-use cities, they increase their impact on the local environment. We know that. They have a big footprint. But they decrease their impact on the global environment more than they increase their in local impact. In other words, their ecological footprint per capita is smaller than low-density sprawl. Most of the people in this room know that. Another way to put it is the urban eco footprint is larger per acre, but smaller per capita, which is what really matters. Cities are greener than they look. Not per capita, suburbs are actually greener. Per, it's all about density. But it turns out density is not enough. You've seen this famous slide by Hank Didmar of Chicago. It, it turned the whole eco argument on its head. Everybody thought, you know, the further you went out, the greener it got, the lower the eco footprint. That's true per capita. It's, this is, has a bigger ecological footprint here, but not per capita. Everything flips when you put people in the denominator. But this is the message from Dubai. Density is not enough. If you don't have mixed use and walkability and transit, it's just high-rise sprawl. Uh, it's a large mosaic of single-use autocentric zones. Density just isn't enough. So to show you just how bad it is, this is the part of Dubai we lived and worked in. And you can see lots of roads, a pretty, pretty uh, intricate network, but in fact, the red roads are the only through roads. So the network's very coarse. That's a development by a single developer. That's basically a gated community. So we lived right here, but if I wanted to play golf there, I had to like drive around. It's unbelievable. Okay, how bad did it get? I worked here in a seven-story, eight-story building where Limitless had its headquarters. It was still in a construction site. This was still being built out. Worked here, lived there. All right, here's my trip home at night. And I could do it with friends, so we had a sort of carpool, although that was technically illegal. We would go out through a series of sort of construction roads. We get out here, we turn right, we go down to this roundabout that's so big it had one, two, three lights in it. Then we drive back here, we go along this freeway pretty fast, loop around here, come back, take a right, go around here, up here, left, and home. It was three times as far as the crow flies. Now, of course, we all cheated. We just drove across the sand here, which was illegal. but. Uh, we were saving gas, pollution, and you name it. it, it but this is, this is I've, Norm, uh, our transportation expert, says, he shows this in his class. It's the most vivid example of the difference between mobility and accessibility. Con connecting networks with frequent intersections reduce mobility. Every time you add an intersection, you have less mobility because you don't move as quickly. 
but you increase accessibility. This is a sort of sub-paradox of the environmental paradox. It's all about the left turn being the weakest link, the Achilles heel, etc. It's more proof that the city is neither a tree nor a work of art. You can sometimes try to do a city as a work of art, as say Louis XIV in Versailles. Sometimes with an autocracy you can pull it off, but this is a very powerful autocracy. You can't do it. There are just too many moving parts. You've seen this diagram. I've adopted it a little bit. To, this is more the Dubai model, the sort of super block with the, uh, all the cul-de-sac subdivisions and gated communities within it. We all know that this provides not only greater capacity, shorter travel times, but even psychologically shorter travel times uh, when the actual trip is a bit longer. So mobility is moving vehicles as fast as possible. It's about higher speeds. They are uh, obsessed with speed. Uh, they don't understand accessibility, getting people where they need and want to be, shorter travel times. It's not about that. It's about speed, although ironically, they put speed bumps on highways. How bad can it get? This is the entire emirate. This is the old part. This is the grid proposed by the Alpha Agency, the Road Transport Authority. They want to build, and you can, we'll go biking out here, we'll find a little bit of a grid out here with an interchange. They wanted to grid the entire country with super blocks. These are, these are a mile by a mile. So it's the super block, super highway, um, super um, high rise model. I don't think they'll ever build this. I think it's about political control of the desert, but uh, can you believe that? So they have built, they have built transit. Indeed, before the, the economic meltdown, they, have, they had completed that. I'm really glad they got that in before the banks started calling their loans. It's the world's largest automated system. It's got good ridership. It's actually working, although it's primarily for the, you know, these, the workers. Uh, who also have very nice air-conditioned buses. There are about a thousand of these buses, which isn't very many. Uh, but what the, no one talks about is private transit. There are 5,000 of these buses. These are the buses that carry these poor guys around. These uh, guest workers from you know, Bangladesh and Pakistan, and et cetera, they, they're being carried around in these private company buses, air-conditioned if they're lucky, uh, to work sites where they work you know, 10, 12 hours a day, six days a week. If these folks were driving in cars, of course, the congestion would be even worse. So this is actually a, a horrible way to solve the problem, but it does help congestion. They, they're just armies, probably at the peak, about a half a million of these people. Uh, it's probably down to half that now. And they're, they're still building away, and they live eight people to a room. They're allowed to stay two years and then maybe get renewed. They can't bring their family, etc. Then there are 190,000 of these little private vans they're taking all sorts of people everywhere. So there is, in fact, a pretty amazing transit infrastructure, but it's private. They love vehicles. They love cars. They're into speed. This is just a stand-in for their obsession with everything from Ferraris to Hummers. So what, is, what are some of the outfalls of this? Traffic fatalities, astoundingly high. Look at the UAE, 24 people per 100,000. USA is 14. France is 7.5. Pedestrians. Unbelievable. You know, there's just no hospitality for pedestrians in any of these environments. They don't even measure cyclists because there's so few. Obesity is worse than America. This is among Emiratis, children and adolescents, 50 percent. We're not so much better. France is half that. And adults are also astoundingly high. And then that leads, of course, to these incredible obesity rates that uh, are worse than the U.S. So I'm going to end, I'm actually ahead of schedule a bit, with a project that, uh, that uh, we, Limitless inher inherited. There's that first palm, just to orient you, that office I was showing you, it was about there, that commute was sort of there. This is a canal, the Arabian Canal, that goes from the Gulf to the Gulf. I mean, it goes nowhere, but it does bring water, ever saltier water, into the desert. And because the sheikh on Tuesday, whenever it was decided, said, oh, let's keep it at sea level, no locks, it means that it's a very big dig because the land here is maybe three, 400 feet above sea level. So you have to dig very big trenches back here. Um, it actually involved, had it been completed more, it would have involved more earth moving than the Panama Canal or the Suez Canal. 
and it was going nowhere. It was basically for pleasure craft and an amenity for this new city that could house up to 2.8 million people that Peter Calthorpe reluctantly um, master planned and then when I got there I sort of changed it a bit um, and we were sort of embarrassed to be working on it. This was, un although I have to tell you, this is completely, it has subways, it has trams, it has light rail, it has the latest water and energy technologies. It does everything right, but it does it in the wrong place. So we were uh, relieved when it was put on hold. This is the sort of scale we're talking about. This is one of the five urban centers. Uh, and we, you know, hired architects, good architects from all over the world, mainly American. And we did, in fact, deal with water. New, water is a big deal, obviously. Everything's salinated by cheap oil. Uh, we dealt with uh, reducing electrical usage con considerably, seven units to two, uh, as well as less demand. And, and the carbon emissions were, this. I mean, it was the right idea, but it was far too big. And, in the wrong place, not just Dubai being the wrong place, but this part of Dubai being even worse. So it was a model in a way. Uh, this is the sort of digging that was going on while I was there. Uh, huge vehicles, earth moving vehicles working 24 seven. Their diesel fuel bill was by, that's the main cost of this sort of construction, the diesel. Um, and that's one reason they have such a high eco footprint is there's so much of this sort of crazy construction going on. So of course, I was later asked, how, what are we going to do with it? So we made it into a park with the, and you know, it was going to be stocked with trout and stuff like that. The only trout fishing in the Middle East. Uh, what's it, is that Yemen? What's that? This was going to beat that, um, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, my guess is it will just remain. Um, a hole that slowly fills up from the water table, actually, a very salty water table. But this is a more serious project. This is along that transit line I was showing you. This, this stop is already built and it'll be extended. This is the land that was given to Limitless to start the company. This young guy Peter and I work for, Peter as a consultant, me as an employee, was the, like the world chess champ at age 14 when, for the 16 and under. And then the, you know, he was an amazing prodigy, the biggest prodigy of the UAE, and a brilliant guy. But, a little bit crazy in some ways. Um, anyway, he took, he was given this land. This is the way development works in the Middle East, exactly as Henry VIII did it in England 400 years ago. The Sheikh says, all right, here's some land. Go forth, develop it, leverage it. You don't actually own it, but you have a deed to it. So these four pieces of land, very valuable, because the big air, new airport's right over here basically was leveraged so that this little company of about 500 people burned through about three billion dollars in five years with projects all over Asia, all over the Eastern Hemisphere. So this one is actually getting built out. These are sort of the infrastructures in and it's actually a TOD, a real TOD. That's a real, this is sort of a half, this is a rendering primarily. That's actually built. This is a big building by Vignoli. The next stop had one by Pelli. The next had one by murphy -Yan. The next had one by, uh, I can't remember, um, I.M. Pay or something like that. Th these are also, this is all built. Uh, this, pr I don't know if this will ever get built. This, the courtyard or the, the space contained in it is big enough to put the Hagia of Sophia in it. Just completely nuts. So anyway, we needed a, my little personal story I'm going to tell you is we needed a mosque. I know we got about two minutes. So that's a mosque I got to design, which is the most fascinating thing I did, as well as overseeing all this, which is actually, this is a beautiful plaza done by SWA, which you can see here. So this is the mosque sort of terminating that. There's the, of course, the minaret. It's rotated to face Mecca. It's very sunny, hot climate, so it's got this sort of magic carpet floating above it at this sort of screen. And uh, it turned out quite by chance quite Nisian because it's a very abs it's a very reductivist, absolutist sort of program and, and no imagery is allowed. And uh, so here's the front of the mosque, the entrance, the only the, the only 
figural form is this little crescent, but it's not even applied. It's actually laser cut through, in a sense, it slices through the solid, what would appear to be a solid limestone. And it's at an angle, so if you stand about where these guys are, you can see the sky through it. I mean, there's a lot, we had a lot of time to really perfect things. You can see, looking back into that space, this is the, the prayer hall surrounded by a reflective pool. This is where, you know, the imam lives, and there's a cafe which opens out, very ecumenical. It was going to be an English-speaking imam, because this is a very international sort of community. So they all have little retail outlets. This is the park. And... Uh, this is what I want to talk about, because that was the first all-glass um, prayer hall ever done. And, and it isn't built yet, but it may get built. Uh, this side of this wall is all water jet cut to be sort of like a eroded sand stone, like the mountains I showed you. Anyway, this glass, he says I have one minute. This is, well, this is the last slide. So at night, this... The rough face facing Mecca has raking light coming up from below and then there's up light on this sort of trellis that shades it and it's got PVs and it's got solar hot water and it's, but most importantly, it has a water bed that cleans the water. Remember, there are a billion Muslims every year doing ablutions up to five times a day. It's a lot of water. So there is, this is all recirculated water which makes a big difference if applied worldwide. And then this is that big main street I started by showing you. This actually is seen by that main street on the way to... So this was the little, this was the fun part of an otherwise collapsing corporation in an economy in free fall. Thank you. I'm not sure how I move this forward. Here we go. Okay. So we're going to go now from uh, the macro to the micro. Uh, Doug showed you uh, <clears throat> uh, at the end of his talk a sort of an opportunistic project. I'm going to show you basically an opportunistic project in China, um, which I think, though, will bring up interesting larger issues um, or related to what... Um, Doug and Dan have discussed. Now, if I can figure out how to. So uh, this is a this is a, frankly a luxury project. It's two million square feet, um, and I'll, I mean I'll show it to you. But it's it's two million square feet, and it's completely at, at the high end of the Chinese market. Um, uh, when we started the project, we wanted to look at what we saw as the best of Chinese urbanism, such as these uh, Shikuman uh, townhouses uh, in Shanghai, which are uh, two or three stories high, and uh, they're mixed use, uh, they have retail below and two stories of residences above. Uh, we love the scale of this development, it's, it's a wonderful place to visit. Um, but uh, mixed use in China, I think, is going to take a few more years. Uh, we just like the scale of it. We also looked at traditional courtyard housing uh, in Beijing, the uh, Xihe Yuan. And this is an example uh, of sort of how they're laid out on the right and on the left. Uh, uh, these are really family compounds that grow over years. And you can see, this thing's not working. On the left side, you can see that that is a family compound with much, many more courtyards uh, built up over many generations. The scale of those courtyards is wonderful, and the, all the primary buildings face south. The entrances are typically south. That's one of the issues that we've had to deal with in all of our projects in China. How do you get everybody to face south and create any kind of urbanism? And you have to ask people to compromise on that. It's the only way to really move things forward. Um, then uh, Dan showed some examples of this kind of housing that was done after, uh, mostly done after the revolution, these slabs that are completely repetitive. And uh, this is in Xiamen, very close to the, our, our project. What's interesting is that even high-end projects are very repetitive like this. And there's a sense that they're sort of making cars and stacking them up. And that if you put gold fixtures in, then that makes them high-end. And what we're trying to tell them, and it's, it's not about the gold fixtures and all that, that real luxury comes with variety and specificity and a sense of individuality. Because no matter how many gold faucets you put 
in that development. It's incredibly depressing. And there's no sense, it seems to me that, uh, this, it's about light and air, of course, everybody faces south, but it's also a way about, in a way about keeping the worker healthy. It's not about the mind at all, or developing community. They didn't want community. They really wanted just healthy workers to show up at the factory. And to me, that's what that looks like. And that's what we want to get people beyond. Um, super towers and super blocks are an issue in China. This is the Shanghai Financial Center in Pudong uh, by KPF, and you can see how tall that tower is. And uh, it's um, a super tall tower. It's about 1,500 feet tall, at least one and a half times the height of the Empire State Building. Um, and then I'm going to show you a series of plans on the left. They're all at the same scale. Um, well, a little later. Um, this is, uh, the Xiamen is located in the Fujian province, and it is a, an island city. And th there are examples in China of wonderful cities, and I always think of them as front of house cities. The Chinese recognize them as front of house cities, and they're the cities that are being developed for the in intelligentsia, for foreign visitors, uh, and they're really quite different and at a much higher level of sophistication because some of the history of these cities have, have survived. In Xiamen, it really is one of those cities. Um, Gulong Island, next to Xiamen, is particularly special. It's a historic European uh, treaty port, uh, and it's full, uh, so it's very interesting in the sense that its urbanism and its architecture is combined, combines uh, Asian or Chinese, in China you never say Asian, it's always Chinese. Um, Chinese planning and architectural influences with Western influences. Um, the Chinese are fascinated by, um, by the West, and they're fascinated by what they can learn. So although they may have learned from some of the wrong examples in the past, actually it's up to us to teach them what the right examples are. They're very willing to listen. They are interested in ideas, actually, um, at an intellectual level. Um, so this is uh, that's a five-minute walk, and this is the urbanism on Gulong Island with a series of small streets. It's very uh, medieval in quality, and this is what it feels like. They've shut it off to automobiles. It's, uh, um, <clears throat> uh, in the last 30 or 40 years, it was famous as a city, another, a small city island where musicians would go to live, and they had, uh, they had music, uh, uh, academies here. Now there are rich people moving in and buying these houses and fixing them up. But the quality of the urbanism with these walls connected to buildings and uh, streets defined by walls, great gates between the streets into private gardens that are still open, uh, a market square on the lower right, are really very pleasant. There are also civic buildings, everything from a Gothic church to a Chinese temple. There are large villas with gardens. And there's a wonderful integration of the urbanism with parks. When we started the project, our client, the Vanke Company, which is the largest residential developer in China, uh, pointed out Gulong Island, gave us a tour and said, look, this is the dream. A lot of Chinese people know about this. Certainly people in Xiamen know about this. We're hiring you because we think you can give us something kind of like this. But then they gave us all the requirements to make it practically impossible. Um, and you'll see what we ended up with. Uh, here's a site in yellow. It's a peninsula on a man-made island. And we're showing here, uh, just right up front, a sort of minimal automobile connections. There's an elevated bus route nearby that will eventually be an elevated train. Uh, but as you look at this overall plan, uh, it is, there, there, is this, there are some uh, sort of super blocks in here. Interestingly, the older ones, even though they're super blocks, they're divided up into a series of smaller blocks, which actually are, work quite nicely. It reminds me of Phoenix, actually, that has uh, squares uh, or super blocks that are mile by mile wide. But some of those work really nicely. Actually, some of them really do work. Are, um, are porous and, and work rather nicely. So it's a matter, of, in a way, partially of what you do with those super blocks. Uh, here is a view of our site with uh, some of the towers going up. You'll see that our site is a story of, partially of how you mix low rise with high rise. Because we, in China, it is very difficult, especially at the high end of the market, to avoid high rise. Uh, the site is 9.5 hectares, so that's about 20 acres. Uh, its total FAR is about two, and it's two million square feet of construction. Uh, this is uh, our concept that we developed in, uh, to win the competition. And it was an idea of a sort of, you know, we, our offices in New York were sort of very influenced by how 
early towers in New York were developed to fit into a city, a city grid, and we really think that's the way to deal with tall towers. Uh, so we did a sort of uh, uh, a range of residential types that went from small houses all the way up to tall towers. Uh, and, and it did it in a way that was rather aesthetically pleasing. You'll see what, what we ended up with that was, I think, a little bit less aesthetically pleasing. But um, this is the master plan. I'm just going to analyze it for you. First, uh, there, there, this, it's really hot. It's hot as hell here. It's, um, but unlike Dubai, it rains. It's sort of like Atlanta, imagine, if you will. A little cool in the winter, but really hot most of the time and very humid. There are prevailing winds, though, because it's an island. There are nice prevailing winds uh, from the north. So, uh, and uh, the, uh, the, the sun is in this diagram comes up from the bottom. So because of those, those two facts, we decided to create a primary axis, a kind of central park that would draw the winds in through the community, uh, that would also keep sun, keep those public spaces as open and sunny as possible. We did a secondary axis that does something similar, related, to, by, by the way, to the fact that North South streets are often the best retail streets because they're, so, they're sunny all day long. Um, then we did uh, radial streets, uh, which connected to water views out on the outside edges. To, uh, we had to convince our client to do these radial uh, streets because they wanted to be able to see the water from everywhere. And uh, we, we told them that actually the views inside this project are probably going to be much nicer than the views outside. And already they're able to see that that's true, actually. Um, because basically what you see from this island, if you have a lot of money, is you get to see the sort of uh, the 50 repetitive towers right across the water that, you know, where your plumber, plumber lives or, or whatever. It's, it's very unappealing. You really want to look inside uh, at, in this project until there's a larger, until we all get out there, I suppose, and have a larger impact on things. Uh, we have a series of irregular blocks, so there's a, there's a sense of trying to capture the irregularity of what we saw in, um, uh, in Gulong Island, but at the same time do uh, a, a, a series of blocks so you can find your way. Uh, those blocks are broken down and fragmented a lot so that they're very comfortable for pedestrians. Uh, then buildings built up on those blocks are broken down, are, are also broken down so that they respond to primary and secondary streets where we have, uh, the buildings are rather simple along these large spaces and then buildings break down in scale so that streets aren't just streets but there are a series of courtyards. And um, you get a sense on the right of how these buildings work with two taller buildings facing two larger uh, streets and then smaller buildings in the middle. That's actually an early diagram. And then here you can see in a model how these side streets become a series of courtyards. Uh, where blocks get large enough, we, do, uh, we did inside courts uh, to create perimeter blocks. Uh, and you can see that the one thing we did, we really hammered in here is variety. There is, every one of these blocks is completely different and it, we drove them crazy. And um, this is the standard kit of parts for a high-end Chinese residential project. You, they want either towers, you want to live in the sky, or you want to have your own house, and that's it. And um, we went in and said, well, to make a real community, you need to have all this other stuff. Uh, you need to have a bunch of buildings in the middle to create a hierarchy, to create differences. Um, at the very high end of the market, they don't like these kinds of, these sort of middle buildings that are sort of street-defining buildings because they're reminded of, of these kind of communist housing blocks that are eight or nine stories high. Uh, but we, we got them to approve that. This is basically our kit of parts, by the way, and even though the, the, uh, the block structure is really irregular. We used a very standard set of types and put them in those blocks and then used uh, parks and walls and smaller pavilions to make sense out of them and connect them to the streets and pathways. Here then is how that kit of parts fits together. Um, uh, uh, the larger blocks define larger spaces and smaller uh, buildings like townhouses define smaller side streets. I'll show you that here. So here are these mid-rise and low-rise blocks defining the major north-south spaces for the most part. Uh, we had to get every one of these buildings approved so that the living room, or at least the master bedroom, would get two hours of direct daylight a day. It is a complete mystery to me how they do it, because they wouldn't tell us. They'd, they'd say, you'll never understand it. Just let us do it. 
And so they would come back and they'd say, well, you have to build, move this building over here and you have to move this building over there. They had very complex computer models, but they really worked with us. And in the end, we got to build a bunch of buildings that don't all face south, but that do still meet the Chinese requirements for minimum uh, daylight. Um, so on the left, the sort of all, this north is slightly raked to the left, by the way. So standard south-facing housing to the left. And then what you do with those blocks, what you need to do with those kinds of blocks if you want to make spaces out of them and community, then uh, townhouses and connected houses and how they're used typically on these side streets. It's sort of like New York where you get uh, tall, taller buildings facing the avenues, small buildings facing the side streets. Uh, and then inside the, uh, the blocks, inside these courtyards, we did a series, a ser a series of tea pavilions and courtyards uh, and, and walls to create smaller spaces. Everybody on the ground floor, because they don't get a view, gets a little garden and a tea pavilion. And we use those tea pavilions. We pulled them out from the apartments because they would block the light into the living room, so that wouldn't work. So it was great. We got to pull them out. Sort of the porches are pulled out and become pavilions and bring an even smaller scale that starts to connect us back to those historic uh, Chinese precedents. Here then, uh, in the end, is, in the center is our project with the kind of uh, uh, texture that, we're, that we got compared to Gulong Island on the left and compared to the uh, Tianjin Fang uh, in Shanghai on the right, which is the mixed-use project with residential above and um, commercial below. Uh, then a comparison, uh, we did have to use uh, high-rise buildings to get the kind of density that, that was required here. Here are our high-rise buildings on the right compared to the uh, SFC in Pudong. It's a, that's, that's a super tower, not a, uh, a point tower like we were doing. Um, uh, and then the blue line in circles shows you a kind of general district where these towers were located along with their shadows so that uh, in the morning, from midday to late afternoon their shadows largely went out of our park and didn't, didn't block light of the, the lower rise residential neighborhood. Uh, density is a big issue here. Um, even in, uh, in China, even in a, a very high-end project, they need to achieve a high level of density we achieved uh, 30.5 units per acre. These are all at the same scale, by the way. Celebration on the right, uh, Battery Park City in the center, and um, our product in Xiamen. Uh, we get 30.5 units per acre, slightly less than Battery Park City, but a much more open feel than Battery Park. Battery Park City feels like the Upper West Side in a way. And what we got, I think, is kind of more of um, Forest Hills Gardens with point towers. Um, and we hope that's what it feels like in the end. Um, uh, there's, a, there's a complex system of parks, uh, starting with a public park around the edge, uh, available to anybody uh, around the lake, everybody can come to it. Uh, then our two primary parks, uh, smaller uh, secondary neighborhood parks. Uh, streets are, cre are done as, created as parks. There are no cars allowed on these streets, by the way. When we first designed this, we really wanted cars on the streets. We lost the battle. And uh, the cars, I'll show you how, how cars are dealt with. So in the end, this is not only do uh, people with money in China, want to, they want to either live high or they want to feel like they're in a resort. And we just sort of took that up. We said, well, let's create a community that's based on some of the planning principles that we're familiar with here, sort of CNU planning principles, but sort of take it to the place where the this Chinese market is going to accept it, which is thinking about it like a resort. This is a picture on the right of one of the walkways at uh, the, uh, the Bel Air Hotel in, uh, in Beverly Hills, uh, or in, um, in Bel Air, LA. And that's sort of what we were thinking of as we thought about how the planting would work. At the same time, you have to be able to fire, drive fire trucks through here, just like we do here, uh, anywhere in the US. So that's all been worked out. This is an example of a private walled garden uh, and that's a tea house in, in the distance. Too bad it's all chopped off, but uh, th that is an actual built example of a private garden. Uh, and then finally, uh, the sort of the sense of the amount of green in this project, while at the same time creating the kind of density that, ba that Battery Park City has, I think is interesting. Um, the parking, as I said, is all below grade. It's all entered from uh, the bottom of the project. There are two major entries and exits. And there are uh, uh, lots of different ways to get from that parking up to your unit. Uh, our favorite type of, is the one that where you come up and you enter on and you come out on a street, and you end up uh, walking down a street and seeing your neighbors and then entering your building. Um, 
there are, uh, there are also ways to enter directly into your townhouse. That's a kind of a luxury requirement. You can take your, from your, you can go from your garage right up to your townhouse. It's very typical of a lot of high-end U.S. Uh, townhouse developments. Uh, and then you can also directly into some of the apartment buildings from below. Um, we found it very interesting that there's a, there's a tradition in China right now of building enormous sales centers which become cloud, uh, clubhouses later on. It's very typical, it's very similar to the Coral Gables model of uh, the great sales center built up at the start, becomes a gatehouse later on. Uh, you, uh, at Coral Gables they brought people to the top of the tower and then showed them their pieces of land. Here they're using it as a sales center because by the time anybody buys an apartment, everything's going to be finished. They're just building it so quickly. Um, this is uh, a clubhouse below with residences above. And here are some of the views of that uh, sales center with a, a main entry court that leads up to uh, the, the main park. You, the, you see there's kind of a Shangri-La quality to this thing. Uh, th this is above the clubhouse, a series of houses which, interestingly, our clients were very concerned about whether anybody would buy them. And they are, I think, they're really lovely. They're amazing it's surrounding these gardens and, a lower, and also surrounding a lowered courtyard which brings light down into the clubhouse. Uh, I think they're probably going to get some of the highest prices for this when people see what the views are like out of those towers. Uh, the project is under construction. The entire project is going to be made out of gold and granite, believe it or not. It's amazing, every bit of it. And, um, and it's sustainable because um, Jamin is basically made out of gold and granite. So uh, it's a lovely material. It's super hard. It's very cheap. In fact, in a lot of China, they think of it as kind of, yeah, it's too bad we can't have limestone, is what they think. Um, you know, and, and we've had clients in Hong Kong uh, have us actually uh, bring limestone in, in from Portugal because this stuff is considered just not all that nice. Uh, it's actually amazing. It's a, I mean, the idea of getting a golden granite for a whole village is, a, is pretty spectacular, I think, from our point of view. Now, these are digital models that we weren't responsible for. They're a little creepy, but they do give you a sense of uh, the density of the urbanism below, the point towers rising up above. I think there's not a great sense of order to these point towers. It's more about keeping views open from the point towers and also about how they fit into the urbanism when you're in it. I think they'll make more sense when you're inside of it than they do from above. Uh, here you are looking down uh, at these various blocks with their tea houses inside and the kind of complexity and variety that I think we were able to create with uh, a very limited number of residential types. Uh, this is the, the canal park on the left side, uh, which some of, the, one of them will have actually glass underneath them to bring light into the, um, into the parking below. Uh, and a view from that canal park back looking uh, north towards uh, the two most expensive towers, will be right, which will be right on the water. They're planned to be the most expensive towers, at least. Then some of the, the walkways. These are the, the narrow walks. We worked very closely with Olin on this to make them feel really lush. And, and uh, Olin actually kept making them too civic, we thought. We said, no, no, we've got, we got to make, let's go for the resort thing. And so they're going to be very lush and very comfortable to walk on. Uh, but you'll be able to blaze through here in a, in a fire truck if you want to. You know, they're wide enough, you, you can you get a fire truck through here. Uh, and then this is uh, the so-called Central Park, which, which has a, a common pool for everybody uh, in the community. In the end, we thought of this as, at the top, from our American point of view, as a sort of a garden community of point towers and with a feeling of a resort. And um, it's something that we've never seen in China, but it's, we sort of put it together from what we were being asked to do, which is they were thinking of the sort of bottom and an image of Xiamen on the left, you know, uh, very iconic towers such as the KPF tower, much larger than what we did, and, uh, and, and their notion of a resort. Um, there it is uh, in what will be its completed stage in maybe three years. Um, now, I think that this is what we accomplished here. I think we, we got our hierarchy of streets and spaces, multiple residential scales, and these are things that are not typically done in, in any product in China, whether it's high end or low end. Uh, we met all the lighting requirements while making nice urban spaces. Uh, we got our point towers to connect to the lower city fabric, partly by our use of classicism, by the way, which I didn't really show you here. Um, uh, and uh, we got a porous connection between this community and the public park. It looks gated, but it's not. 
it's actually all those radiating streets connect to paths and steps that go down to the surrounding public garden. So in that sense, it is open. Um, the things that we didn't do, weren't able to do, and I think these, these sort of tasks ahead, you can't do everything on one project. Uh, it's not real mixed use. Uh, the, our clients didn't want to have any retail at all. We tried to convince them to have it. In the end, the government forced them to have one retail space, and I think it's hysterical what they're, they're, they're forcing them to have a fish market. So it's like the smelliest thing you can imagine, and it's going to, it'll be very amusing to see how they, everybody responds to that. Uh, it's certainly not a, a mix of incomes. We would love to have had more of a mix of incomes than we had here. We certainly didn't, weren't able to combine the pedestrian and automobile experience. I think that we all would agree that having a kind of seamless experience between being in your automobile, if you have to be in it, and your walking experience is a nice thing, and that separating them entirely is maybe a little odd, although it happens a lot in you know, great old European cities. You leave your car in a parking garage on the side of, the, of, the, uh, of town, and then you go in and walk or ride your bike. That's what these people will do. And also making larger city connections. This being an, a small opportunistic project, of course, wasn't about making those connections, but we know that that is something we need to do and try to accomplish as we as new urbanists do new projects in China. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. That's a spectacular project. I was worried that this morning wasn't going to hang together. But what an extraordinary uh, confluence of things. What Leo showed us uh, as a kind of uh, polemical stance uh, against what Doug showed us as the counterforce and a remarkable mediation uh, between those things, the finding of the, the cracks in that uh, juggernaut of modernist orthodoxy that is uh, worldwide, uh, which we've tried to, with our project, to address, and which I, I think Robert, Stern, Robert A. M. Stern, Paul, uh, have taken to a spectacular uh, realization of a kind of partial completion of a uh, real challenge uh, to the models that have been so enormously destructive of urbanism around the world. So I think it does hang together, uh, and uh, th thank, you, thank you both for, for doing that, and thank Leo also, uh, who I think is uh, not here, but is very much part of this conversation. So um, we're open for questions. We've got uh, actually as long as people want. Um, questions or commentary uh, on this, and then uh, we'll break for lunch when the conversation peters out. And we have somewhere, um, my, oh, yeah, come up to the mics, please. Hi, that was really fascinating, the whole thing, and um, I do have a couple kind of specific questions. Uh, first, in uh, Dubai, what do you think is the cause of the very nonsensical um, highway engineering? Um, what, what is, uh, do they not have professional help? Um, and then, I was wondering what is the cost of the Chinese project in rough, and how would that cost translate in the United States, uh, here in the United States? So uh, they absolutely get professional help. They get the best, or at least the most expensive in the world. They just get the wrong ones. Um, the actual shake sub-ruler who runs that alpha agency has a lot of power. I think he's still chasing a L.A. Phoenix model on steroids. I mean, when the, the ruler goes to Brazil and sees a 15-lane freeway, he says, I want one of those. I mean, it's, it's sort of at that level. It's top-down, as the next questioner can attest. He works in El Main. So they're just chasing a, a dead model. I think they're slowly figuring it out. Uh, but they like anything that's spectacular. They, they, they make the most Baroque interchanges. They're unbelievable interchanges, much more complex than anything in L.A. And they're proud of them. I mean, it's, it's all showmanship. Uh, Doug, uh, one of the things I find fascinating living out there is the comparison between Dubai and Abu Dhabi, just 100 miles apart. And while Dubai is still, while Dubai is, sorry, while Abu Dhabi is still quite extravagant, 
the comparison between Abu Dhabi and Dubai is quite stark. So I'd just like you to make a comment on that if you could. Well, Abu Dhabi is a more conservative culture. It's more religious. I think they're going for the longer haul. They're more <clears throat> interested in sustainability. Dubai was, had no resources. Abu Dhabi has an immense amount of oil. Uh, uh, Dubai doesn't. Dubai knew it had to become a finance center, a tourist center, uh, a port, a very successful port. It's still a very successful port, a very successful airport. So they're, they're sort of the Singapore, which is model on Hong Kong, and the Switzerland. It's a completely different model. It's much more progress progressive. It has to cater to Westerners more. So it's, it's, it's not as uh, sort of Arab or Muslim in a way as Abu Dhabi. Um, so it's more of a flash in the pan mentality, I think. Um, I have a question about this idea of opportunistic interventions. Um, certainly, um, the project in, in China and Xiamen is very, very beautiful. There's uh, an incredible amount of detail, and the planning banca must be a very sophisticated client. Um, but in lots of other parts of China, India, from what Doug showed, it seems like in the Middle East, there are places where the, the building of individual buildings, the need for housing, has outpaced um, the planning of those areas. Um, I feel like these are the kinds of developments that have been referred to this morning as destructive. And I'm, so I'm wondering if in what, what you would have to say about places like these, what kinds of opportunistic interventions could take place where you have skyscrapers coming out of the dust, for example, where there are no roads, there's no infrastructure, but there are enormous buildings. Uh, I think that's, is this on? Can you hear me? Okay. Um, what I've, I'm fascinated by, because we're doing work in India too, is that there is this great respect in places like India and China for luxury product, product, products like a Mercedes-Benz. And everybody knows they're willing to spend a huge amount of money on a Mercedes-Benz and pay taxes on it and everything. But they're not willing to spend money on ideas or take time to develop ideas. And I think that's a huge problem, that they want to build... First, they want to build everything really fast, but then there really is no sense of respect for ideas. And what you need is I, to, get to get away from all that horrible um, repetition, you need somebody to think about it. You know, you need somebody to sit down and take some time, and, and you can do it pretty quickly, but you, you can't give them a day. You know, you, you, you have to give somebody some time, somebody that knows what they're doing, bring them in, you have to bring in an expert, and, and, and be able to pay them something for their ideas. They have a really tough time with that. And I think that until they get used to the idea that, that, I, that, you, that you, it, it would be fine if they could copy good ideas really well, but in my experience they can't. Not yet. They will. But, um, but right now they need to bring in good planners um, and, and, um, and pay them what they need to pay them. So I think that's part of the problem. I, I think there are, is this on? I think there are opportunities that they are they're rare. They need to be seized aggressively when, when they appear. Um, Twenty years ago, uh, brilliant professor Wu Lang Yong, who's the sort of legatee of a great uh, heritage of Chinese urbanism, proposed a beautiful model of courtyard housing, which he worked on for three or four years with uh, studios, at, uh, his, his design studios at, at, uh, uh, at um, University in, Ch in Beijing, um, Qinhua. Qinhua, Qinhua, yeah. Um, that was built, it was called the Ju Er Hutong. It was a perfect model for the continuity of courtyard housing traditions at high, at high densities. And it was uh, celebrated throughout the world and then ignored. Uh, and it was ignored because it was too slow, it took too much thought, uh, it could not keep pace with the scale and the pace of need, um, and uh, it, it fell by the wayside. The reason we have a little opportunity uh, uh, in, in China is from a group of people who call themselves the Berkeley Nine, who were uh, graduate exchange students 15 years ago at Berkeley, uh, who took design studios with Peter Calthorpe and me and Alan Jacobs um, uh, and Don Linden, uh, and now they're planning directors. 
in, in Tianjin, and they meet regularly. They're good friends, uh, and they've asked us to come in and to create, to try to work with the solar ordinance to create a perimeter block. Uh, what a great uh, opportunity! But uh, I think that there are these uh, occasional enlightened clients, occasional enlightened bureaucrats, uh, occasional opportunities for all of us if we're resourceful about them, uh, and that this. Uh, or th this juggernaut, which is based upon simple replicability, uh, the, the monomaniacal dominance of this uh, solar obsession, which is more prevalent in northern Chinese cities than, than, than in the middle of, than southern Chinese cities, um, uh, and the, the hegemony of the super block, which is what Doug showed in, in Dubai. Uh, that's beginning here and there amongst interventions of uh, largely American firms uh, to break down. Uh, the, the building in, in Shanghai of Shenzhen Di, which is uh, uh, the first historic preservation piece uh, ever, you know, in many decades uh, in, in China, was a gigantic uh, commercial success. Uh, that, that has such an impact around the country, the fact that old buildings restored as mixed use have made millions and millions of dollars for a developer, uh, many hundreds of millions of dollars for a developer, uh, uh, had got their attention, got their attention in a very big way. And San Francisco SOM had a lot to do with that. Uh, so the, 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 the bringing of, of uh, a, an urbanistic sensibility to this juggernaut uh, uh, is going to have an effect because the breaking apart of that juggernaut, the pollution, the congestion, the miserable nature of the cities that are being created by it uh, is pretty obvious. So I, I'm optimistic that, this, that over the next uh, decade or so, there's a lot of opportunity for a lot of us yeah, I, uh, to, I to make a real contribution. I want to second that. Can we turn the lights up? We've got these headlights shining on us. Is there some control? Um, there's not a, a lot of tradition of urbanism in the part of the Middle East uh, Dubai situated in, so there's not a lot to build on. There are some old souks. There are some sort of lower rise urban fabric. Um, is it just possible to turn the ceiling lights off? Ah, good, we can see you now. So um, what the opportunities are these little individuals, as Dan was saying, this fellow that was asked to run this Limitless Company bought into new urbanism, and he became the, the sort of antidote. He was on a mission to not only do that sort of development in Dubai, but all over China and all over, you know, Russia and Egypt, North Africa, Middle East, parts of Europe. There are these these people who get it, um, and they have absolute power, and that's why I think Dan's right. Once they get it, they have a lot more power. I was at a meeting just visiting Limitless before I even accepted the job. And within about a 20-minute time span in a meeting with consultants from all over the world, really top Dutch, American, on that canal, that big Arabian Canal, they decided to do subways rather than elevated lines in about 20 minutes. That would take 20 years in the United States to decide. So when they do decide and act, they act pretty decisively. I think China's going to get its act together around sustainability pretty quickly and dramatically. They already are the world's largest producer of solar and wind machines. However, it's, it's growing only so they can maintain the level of electrical production by coal at 70%, which is absolutely unsustainable. So as fast as solar is growing, it's only keeping up. Uh, it's not getting ahead. So there, there are some big structural challenges as well, but they will, they take water very, very seriously in China because it's a dry place to begin with, northern China. They're really worried about that. They're not just, it's not just rhetoric. Peter Calthorpe tells the story, I, I don't think is apocryphal, is that uh, he was in Chongqing uh, where they have a vast uh, uh, public transport public transit subway, light rail system under construction. Uh, and they had also built a very large factory for solar panels. 
the factory for solar panels was at one of the rail stops. And Peter said, you put it in the wrong place. The density of population uh, per square foot of building is too low here. Uh, to put it at a transit stop, and the next came a trip back to China, they were tearing down the solar plant and moving it uh, because they agreed with his assessment of the uh, uh, inappropriateness of the use. Uh, so it's, su it's such a volatile, fluid, incredible situation of investment on a scale that we've never uh, imagined uh, and uh, speed that we've never imagined so that interventions actually takes, take place. Things happen. Um, and they, they will happen and happen very rapidly over, over the next few years. Uh, I, I agree that there's going to be great progress in China. One of the things that China has is a real interest in the public realm, uh, which if, when you go to India, you realize the shocking difference between those two countries where there's absolutely no interest in the public realm in India from what I can see. Um, in China, they, they, they plant trees uh, on, on, on city boulevards everywhere for shade, so you don't have to use your air conditioning so much. And there, uh, you can take uh, a highway uh, 150 miles, and it's lined by trees. It's, un it's unbelievable what they'll spend. And also, they spend a lot of money on public parks, so that there is a sense that they want to spend money on common spaces. And I think that if we can go in there, or sort of we can also, they will listen to good ideas about how to create public spaces in cities. Um, as far as the pollution, by the way, I think that we all uh, need to take a little bit of the blame for that pollution because frankly, when I went over there, what I realized, I, I just looked around and I thought, this is disgusting, it's, just, it's so polluted, but I thought, well, well of course it is. The, the West has sent its pollution to China and that's why we can have our wonderful laptops and um, and why New York has clean air and London has clean air because we have sent all of our industry to China. You know, it's, that's how we can afford all this stuff. And it's very point. natural and that's why the West can have the luxury of having such clean air. So we're complicit in some of this, guys. Yes. Let's take about one or two more and then I think it's lunchtime. So a question over here. Um, uh, I, I appreciated the comments on China and Dubai having worked in both those places. And just a factual thing, Doug, uh, the, the reason that the traffic doesn't work is because they borrowed the British system. It'd be nice to blame the Americans for that, but it's actually British traffic engineering taking everything out of direction. Um, and your descriptions of having to drive across the sand to uh, you know, actually get to where you want to go is a very apt one for Dubai. Uh, my question is of, for a place of a different scale. I'll be working on the rebuilding of Christchurch, which is, you know, a old classical city that's been destroyed by earthquakes, and so now they have to figure out how to rebuild the city. Uh, and I'm interested in your insight in a, uh, how you might apply some of your lessons in a place like Christchurch. There will be a city, rebuilding a city of a half a million people, but at a slower pace. Um, and uh, what we might uh, learn not just from these hyper uh, places in terms of speed, but creating, recreating urbanism after a national disaster. I've never been to Christchurch. I've been close to it. I understand it's a nice city, or was. Um, it is true that Dubai adopted the roundabout and other English models. In many ways, it developed with the worst of British and American models. They took the roundabout and made it three and four lanes. Roundabouts don't work. There are many more accidents, collisions at the roundabouts in Dubai. Just, they don't work when they're at that blown up to that scale. And some of them are so big they have lights as well. It's, so you're right. The super block, super highway, plus the roundabout, plus unbelievable energy. I don't know what to say about Christchurch. I mean, we don't know it very well. But I, it's a different culture. I mean, New Zealanders are very thoughtful people compared to, I mean, they have a, a much longer history uh, in terms of the sort of development we're seeing. I, it's more like England than Australia is, um, having lived and worked in Australia, but I, I don't know, do you know anything about it? I, I, I think it's a different condition. We're, we're talking about, in both of these two instances, is what you call the prosperity bomb. You know, it, it, it is, uh, it's the instantaneous wealth an instantaneous transformation of you know, a vast society that has produced this simplistic uh, ad adaptation of, of the worst of Western models. Uh, and I, I think in a, 
in a, a place where the economy is less hysterical, it's quite, it's quite different. So I, I don't know about New Zealand, but I don't think it's under the same... Uh, it's the it's same, one of the most middle-class countries yeah, in the world, and if there's anything the Middle East lacks is a middle class, and China's getting one fast, but it historically hasn't had one. To this. Well, my guess is they're going to get the citizens involved, which is not the case in these two other countries we're discussing. The citizens aren't involved at all. Zero. Uh, it's top down. I think it's just so much less top down there. I, I think metabolism calls, and it's time uh, time for us all to uh, uh, go to lunch. And thank you very much to Doug and to Paul for for, for this terrific session. Thanks. Thanks so much.